Mm. If we're honest. Nobody's going to say anything. Well, what about if you have days when you're by yourself, how do you lie? <laughs> you lie to yourself. It's another lesson for our gallant leader. <laughs> um, Stacey, let's go ahead. We're going to do this now. I promise we're going to tie this together. We're going to try and go kind of fast here. Um, Exodus 1, 15, 21. Let's just see how this stuff plays out in, in biblical narratives. Real loud, Stacey. Real loud. 1, 15, 21? Mm-hmm. Then Pharaoh the king of Egypt gave his order to the Hebrew midwives. Do I have to pronounce names? No. Shimbera and Hua. <laughs> when you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. The midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared, feared God, they gave them families of their own. Okay. What happened? They lied. They lied. There's no other way to put it. They lied. But what does it say about God and his opinion of that? He doesn't like it. doesn't like it, but he blessed them. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Okay. Um, well, Mark, it's never tough to honor God or honor man. You always honor God. You're right. You're right. And so we're going we're gonna to get right to zero in right there. Um, we're not going to read this, but in Matthew 1, we're going to talk about Christ's genealogy. You remember there's a lot of people in there that everybody knows. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay. There's also women in the genealogy. Everybody knows. Them. What's the very first one before Christ? His mother. His mother, Mary. Okay. Um, Bathsheba, you've heard of her? Okay. So wait a minute. What did Bathsheba do? She committed a kid. Gave birth to Solomon. Gave birth to Solomon, right? <laughs> what happened before that? She slept with David. Nobody listened to church tonight? Yeah, you got pregnant. An adulterous relationship. Yeah. Maybe not of her initiation, but it was an adulterous relationship. Yes, it was her. Hmm? Do you know where the king is? Do you know where David's room is? Yeah, these women are, Joe. Yeah, they are. Who is this? Uh, Wasn't she also married at the time and they killed her husband? Yeah. Yes. 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 Was that getting too deep into that? Yeah. That's that's next week. Yeah. 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 Let's not get too deep into that. That's that's next week's deal. Okay. <laughs> uh, we also had Ruth now. Ruth, pretty good, right? We don't have any bad stuff about Ruth. Who was before Ruth? Anybody have an idea? Rahab. So you got the hand out. Rahab. 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 Rahab was a prostitute. Okay. Uh, but Judy, you're doing this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's read it. it you know, go as quick as you can. We're going to do all 24, 1 to 24. Okay. Then Joshua, the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all, search out all the land. But the women had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax which she had laid in order of the roof, on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of 
you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and when you and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Shiloh and Gog, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. And spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters, who all belong to them, and with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window of her house, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, Go to the hill country, lest your pursuers happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return, and afterward you may go on your way. And the men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, and gather yourself into the house of your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if a hand is laid upon him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which you have made us swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied a scarlet cord in the window. And they departed and came to the hill country, and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road, but had not found them. Then the two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they related to him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and all the inhabitants of the land, moreover, have melted away before us. All right. Everybody got that? I know that was a lot, but our, our reading's kind of done. But, but let's look at, there was a reason for this. We need to look and see what happened here, why it happened, and how God looked at it. So the first thing, and we go, we go to our outline now. Um, where we got to this, everybody know this was that the Israelites had been in the, in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 plus years. Um, they were trying to go to the land that God promised them. And there was a city that stood in their way that they had to get past to get to the promised land. Where the city was? The important pagan city of Jericho. Jericho. Okay. Um, and Joshua sent two what? Yeah, spies. spies into the river to check out the city and report back to him because they had to figure out how to take this city. Because God says, we're going to deliver it into your hand. Now, two spies go to stay at the house of Rahab, the prostitute. prostitute. Okay. Um, now we come to this. What were the signs of the times? What was Rahab's frame of mind regarding these two people? Did she know who they were? Initially, probably not. I mean, it doesn't say she did, but it does say she was a prostitute. They went to the brothel in the city of Jericho, which was a pagan city. This was not, they weren't worshiping God anymore. But she saw the signs of the times. If you, and we're not going to read it, but in verse 9 through 11 that, that you already read, Rahab saw that her world, as she knew it, in the city, was what? Anybody have an idea? Destined for destruction. And how did she know that? This is why. She said it in her conversation with says, We realize, the people in the town and everything, that we're in trouble. That your God is the God of gods. We heard what he did. We heard what he did, the two cities he destroyed, the two peoples he destroyed for them, how he got them out of the land of Egypt. They heard all this. But only one person acted on it. That was right. The rest of them, they weren't doing anything. That's why the spies were in there. And they went probably divinely by leading from God to her. 
she realized, you know what? My world's going to change. Because their God is pretty strong. We see what he's done. She didn't want to be destroyed in it. So, uh, again, this, trying to go fast here. Matthew 24, we're not going to read. Also, the signs that Jesus gave us for the signs of the time for the world, it's a direct correlation. He said, the world as we know it, or as his disciples were at the time, was going to change. And it was going to change drastically. And he goes through all the changes, which, you know, you have a chance to read it, Matthew 24. Um, now we go to an act of faith. Everybody in the country could see that blank was coming. And in the country, we're talking about the city of Jericho. That was their country. That was their walled-in world. Uh, God's kingdom. And they blank the blank. They feared the consequences. Everybody, they saw what was coming. They saw what had already happened on behalf of the people, the Israelites. So they knew change was coming. Out of all the people in Jericho, Rahab was the only one who did anything. Right? She took them in. The others had belief. They all believed. They knew. But Rahab had faith. Now, here's where we get to where this kind of starts tying together. An act of faith in God is an act of treachery against the world. Reason being, we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world where just take the lying part. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. And that is a problem because it's very easy to get accustomed to it, to fit in. It's, it's, it's real easy not to hurt somebody's feelings. It's real easy not to do what you know you should do. Because the more you do it, the easier it gets. Now the reason we're like that is because we live in a world where who is in charge? Yeah. Say, the devil. But we have a caveat. We're saved by grace. In the end, Rahab was not saved from the destruction by what she did. She was saved by the mercy of the Israelites. And again, to save time, if you know the story, she said, I'll hide you. And she did. She took him up on the roof and she hid him under the, uh, the, the flax stuff. And then told when the guards came and said, we hear that these two men came. She said, oh yeah, they did. They came, but I sent them away. And if you go right now, you can probably catch them. And I sent them over there. And the whole time they're hiding on the roof. She knew that. That's a lie. She knew that. But she again, played, she played let's make a deal. She did. Exactly. Because she saw the proverbial handwriting on the wall. Like, this place is going down. This is my only way out. So she made a deal. She said, let's make a deal. She says, tell you what, I'll hide you, but please don't destroy me and my family. Everybody knows that? That was in the story. Judy read it. Um, and they did. But did they save her because of what she did? But they didn't save her because of what she did. They saved her. The mercy. What saved her was the mercy of the Israelites. Because they said, if you hang the red cord in your window, because her window on the wall faced outside, we will tell the soldiers, don't touch that house. And her and her family was in that house. Everything else was going to be destroyed. That was a symbol. Now, just a coincidence that it was a red cord. What do we know? Well, I'm going to say this because growing up outside of the world, this was, we all knew this. Uh, what do you call an area where there's a lot of prostitutes? A district. A district. A red light district. You know that, right, Larry? Uh, also, now let's think about that. This was a red cord as a symbol for the Israeli army to pass by and not destroy them. What had just happened 40 something years before to the Israelis? Passover. Passover. We just had the Seder two weeks ago. Over, blood over the thing. Right? It's a symbol. It was a symbol. But what saved her was God's grace. 
Not anything she did. That was what saved her. Mark, one of the things that I think she believed God. Yes. That's what saved her. That's what Her belief. She believed that. Not the belief, her faith. Faith. Everybody believes. Everybody believes. It's the faith part that does save you. That's the part that we All the signs are there are we going to trust God. We're going to believe. Here's the fact. James 2.19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shut it. Y'all make a note. James 2.19, look it up. Make sure I'm not lying to you. It's not just a belief like Joe says. You have to act on it. The demons all believe. They know God is God. They know Christ is the Messiah. But do they have faith to change their ways? No, because they're demons. She had belief and faith. The whole rest of the town had belief. But they didn't do anything about it. They had faith. Now, okay, we're going to skip a little of this here. Here's the main crux of the story. Some uh, translations will say that Rahab wasn't really a prostitute, that that's just a translational error, that she was like an innkeeper and all that. Well, also in James 2.25, he says Rahab... James says of Rahab, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did? Hebrews 11.32, by faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Again, the obedience, the acting. She did something about it. Now, is it wrong? Because we'll all agree she lied to the soldiers. Right? She lied. Here's, here's where God clues us in on this. Larry and I talked about this last week. It's always been a problem for me. It's like, Rahab lied. God says don't lie. The midwife lied. God says don't lie. There's other instances in the Bible. In 1 Samuel, where he was told, go here and say this. God tells him, say this. Not exactly what they're doing. He was going to find David to be the king. So how do we rationalize that? Here's why. And if you go down, I wrote it out so I wouldn't mess it up. I can find it. Okay. Does anybody know? Let me find her name. Corey Ten Boom. Anybody know what that name is? You know that? Karen? You should know that, right? Yeah. Okay, what is it? I know it's Jewish. She was the one in, in wartime Poland that hid a lot of the Jews from the Nazis and saved their lives. She lied to protect innocent children, innocent lives. Here's the deal. This is what all this is about. Because we live in a fallen world and the situation it's in, that if we are going to obey God and be obedient to God and His teachings, we are committing an act of treachery against the world because we go in our world it's a common thing saying your beliefs Charlie they're different from mine but it's okay we can both have them but is it true? can we believe two different things and one of them be true and one of them not be? as far as relative to God does he exist? If I say he doesn't exist and you say he does, can we just say, let's just agree to disagree, that we're both right? No. One of us is wrong, because either there's a God or there's not a God. Because we live in a world of treachery. Now, if I said that, and Charlie stands up and says, no, there's one God, almighty God, and I know him. Then we're honoring God, but we're committing treachery against the world. If... If I say, I have an open marriage, why don't I have an open marriage? I'm allowed to go out and sleep with women and all that stuff. Well, no one, I wouldn't be here, she'd be killed for that. But uh, if you keep sex within the confines of marriage as it is, you are committing an act of treachery against the world. Because what does the world say? All you got to do is watch TV. Not only is it acceptable, it's promoted. It's promoted. Homosexuality is not only now a taboo word to talk about, they promote it. Now, 
And again, this is what, what Ed was referring to there. Your babies are born. Everybody's been in a delivery room when their child was born, at least one of them or something like that. Did you look down and say, oh, great, I got a homosexual. Great, I got a heterosexual. No, you got a boy or a girl. But yeah, we're not allowed to talk about that because if you do, you're committing an act of treachery against the world. And who rules the world? The same. The destruction of morality is important to accomplish the goals. So we have to understand the context that because we live in a world, we don't always have not only the ability, but the discernment to understand there is no pure good and pure evil. Sometimes there's something in the middle. We've got to make a conscious decision because we are allowed to make choices. Now, Corey Ten Boom, the midwives, Rahab, all made decisions that we would all consider to be lies. Rahab lied to the soldiers. Corey Ten Boom lied to the Nazis, saying, you know, they were gone. She hid those Jews. There's a lot of Jews that live because of that woman and their family. Put herself at great risk. And then you had you know, Rahab and the midwife. They all lied. But what was the point? To save innocent lives. To save innocent lives. That's the key to the whole thing. Now, yes? Well, we were talking about this other night about lying. And I was telling you, God, we can't hide anything from him. Right. He knows our intent. So God knows Rahab's intent, her intent. And when somebody's lying like that, that's to save somebody. Yeah, he knows absolutely. your intent is love. Then he also knows when you're lying, when you're in the practice. Just look at the clips. Mm -hmm. Look at the clip. You're lying for self-preservation because you don't want to look bad or you want to gain something. Like you're an attorney and you get a big fee if you get this guy off. You know, that's not the same thing. Is Corey Ten Boom is lying to the Nazis so they won't kill a bunch of innocent little Jewish kids. There's a difference there. There's a moral difference there. And that's what Satan would like to cloud the issue and make us not realize or make us realize that he would want us to think there's no distinction. Because if he can get us all to say it doesn't matter, that's a lie, and that means the Bible is promoting lying. What has he done? He's convinced people to discredit the entire word of God as being false. Also, this mark though, there are particular American women and uh, uh, Rahab, midwives, they're all, their lives are at stake. Absolutely. The easy way out is to say, there they are. Yep. Because if they would have caught. And they are okay. But they did, like, like Donna said, they did it to preserve and protect innocent lives. Now, it's the same thing, I'm sure everybody here would agree with because Larry and I had mentioned this to each other. If somebody knocked on my door and said they wanted my son Matthew and they're going to kill him and I know it, there's not a lot of discussion in my mind about whether I want to give him up. I'm not going to say, okay, go ahead because I'm not going to lie to you. He's right here. I'm going to protect my family with everything I've got. Now, is that wrong? I don't think so. Because I think Donald's was right. I think that's the crutch of the whole thing. If you are protecting innocent lives, we are in a world that is not black and white. There's a whole lot of gray. And we can't always pick perfection and pure evil. We may not have that choice. But let's take that a step further. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, weigh out an example we'll be given tonight. That Matthew has a buddy of this for another 12 year old. And the knock is on the door and he says, Give that boy up. Over my face. Yeah. If it's not my son. The risk. That's what exactly. I'm the risk of saving other people that way. Yeah. It, it goes to the same thing. When, you know, when Abraham was told to, to sacrifice Isaac, oh, I'm just being honest. I couldn't do that. I would fail that test. I could not do that. And again, I think Donna's right. And Larry's right. And Joe's right. We have to find that crux that falls with being treacherous to the treacherous world to protect innocence. And we have, um, we're given the ability to discern on those things. Does that mean we're always going to be right? No. But he kind of made the guideline there just in these few examples 
that if you're protecting innocent life, you do what you got to do. Because the treacherous side doesn't deserve to take innocent lives. Everybody agree with that? I could be right. That's my opinion. Yeah. Taking a stand. Mm -hmm. Taking a stand. Well, you have to. Right. Oscar Schindler, I thought of also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. And again, it, it's tough because we have to look at it and say, well, who am I to make this kind of judgment? That's why you've got to stay in the Word. Because our guidelines are there. And if you stay in there, the treacherous part of the world can't infiltrate and mess you up. Yeah, Greg? Hmm? I can't hear you, Greg. Tell me this way. Which one? Oh, tennis to nine? Oh, okay. That's a good one. Thanks, Greg. All right. Um, <laughs> I need Greg. I need Greg. Larry, will you pray us out then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a wonderful, thoughtful, and penetrating lesson that uh, you had your child Mark deliver for us tonight. Thank you so much for that. Wow, it's, it's something that we can not only take internally and 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 take inventory with ourselves, but we understand our position with you so much clearer. And we understand how we can teach these now to our families. Father, Lord, thank you so much for truth. Because one of the things that Jesus told us is that the truth will set us free. And that's what you are, Father. You are the truth. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We want to thank you for the food you're blessing us with tonight, for the nourishment of our body, to lift these gifts up to you. We want to celebrate and, uh, and fellowship with our birthday people tonight and you grow to breathe life into them so that they can serve you and be with you and, and to share the gospel. And that's why we're here tonight, Lord, to learn and become much more closer to you and doing so. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for Mark. Thank you for the class. Thank you for the wonderful message that uh, Ed and Lisa put on tonight. Let it be an inspiration to our, our lives. And let us spread the word of Jesus throughout Broward County. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Great job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. 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 Yeah.